I want to thank everybody for uh, uh, coming to our virtual Fisherman's Roundtable. Uh, never as much fun as the in-person, but at least we have one. That's, uh, that's a big deal. That's a big deal. So uh, uh, excited to host everybody. I look forward to this every year. I get a lot of information out of this. Uh, uh, some from uh, our experts here, uh, but a lot from the questions you guys ask uh, uh, going forward. It's really nice to have Barry and, and Ryan here. Uh, they've been very generous with their time. Uh, I assume this is probably very helpful for them uh, to get a sense of where the community is, uh, what the fishermen and women are thinking, uh, and how the programs are working uh, in real life. I do that all the time. It's one of the beautiful things about coming back home is you think you're doing all this work in Washington, D.C., hoping it rolls out well. But uh, much like with the CARES Act, we had to make a lot of changes. And that's the, that's the beauty of having this, uh, this dialogue going, uh, going forward. Uh, Congress has been a little difficult uh, this year. I thought it was bad last year. Well, actually, COVID relief was actually a bright spot. Uh, the pandemic was horrible, but uh, uh, the way you uh, guys uh, adjusted it was pretty amazing, uh, both in the fleet uh, and in the, uh, in the manufacturing warehouses. Uh, it was pretty impressive how you dealt with things and uh, kudos to, uh, to you all. Uh, but uh, Congress finally stepped up and hopefully gave you a little bit of relief uh, you know, we actually, I put a little, well, quite a little bit of effort along with some of my colleagues uh, with coastal communities, uh, making sure fisheries were represented. It was not just inland businesses, but uh, those uh, men and women that work on our coast and in our fleet also were hopefully able to access some of the uh, CARES package money. I'd like to hear a little bit about that from folks. Uh, what worked and frankly, what didn't work. Uh, you know, there's always glitches uh, as you roll things out. We've been trying to support NOAA big time. We're very lucky to have Barry where he is. Uh, uh, we've got a new director now too, which is pretty cool. And gonna have some, I think it, you know, the Oregon representation back in uh, uh, Washington DC uh, in NOAA is actually pretty pretty robust right now. So uh, I think we're very fortunate, uh, very fortunate for that. Uh, we've been pushing on the appropriation side, uh, a lot of letters to support like we usually do for the Pacific uh, uh, Salmon Fisheries Council for you know, more robust data. That's the key, the hallmark to maintaining our fisheries is good information. A lot of men and women in the fleet help contribute to that data that uh, NOAA uses to help set uh, benchmarks for us going forward. So very excited about uh, uh, what's going on. Uh, uh, the fisheries uh, community has worked really hard and get through the pandemic uh, you know, with the recovery, uh, catch sheriff program, hopefully coming to a little more maturity, uh, we'll be in a much better spot, uh, moving forward. Got a good, uh, set of panelists, uh, some familiar faces, some new, but, uh, catch up on what's going on here. Uh, what I'm going to do, I'm going to turn it over to Barry and Ryan for some introductory remarks. Uh, and then we'll go to the different panelists. You guys all be muted while the panelists give their presentation. Uh, and then we'll unmute for the Q&A uh, afterwards. And I'll kind of ride herd on uh, our panelists to try and stay on time. So you guys have opportunity to do some of the, uh, uh, some of the Q&A Q at the end of the, end of the program. And with that, why don't we uh, turn it over to uh, uh, Barry come lately and uh, have him uh, give a few remarks, he and Ryan both. Thanks, Rob. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, sorry, I was a little bit late this morning. It's good to see you. Good to see everybody. I see Lori and Mike on my screen. So uh, a lot of experts here that know probably a lot more than I do. But yeah, there's a, a little thing called a drought uh, happening in Southern Oregon and California that seems to occupy more of my time than anything as of late. So trying to work through that. I know it's a challenge for both the fishing and the fishing community uh, on those fronts. Um, yeah, so I was just going to run down just a few updates. I know a lot of folks, uh, individuals probably have a lot of these updates uh, moving forward, but sort of the state of the West Coast, uh, state of Oregon in terms of the fisheries perspective and fisheries service perspective. And I'll start out, you know, one, uh, we made it through last year. Um, <laughs> as challenging as it was. Um, so, you know, hats off to everybody, I think, doing what they can to actually get us through last year, given COVID, and, and that we know there are, you know, tremendous impacts to the commercial industry, the charter industry, uh, and moving that forward. The COVID relief money has, has gotten out, at least on the Oregon side, for a portion of that. There'll be, I think there's some more coming, uh, so that's good, and thanks thanks for that. I, but it, it really was an impact, and, and people really did pull together, I think, to try to figure out ways to work through it. 
uh, you know, on the you know, fishery side, working with the council and the industry to get some emergency rules out. We extended some of the fishing seasons like sable fish to, to actually allow, you know, flexibility related to COVID so on the whiting fishery made some changes there as well. Um, uh, we did lose surveys last year. I mean, there was a big hit to the data and information collection on the West Coast, as well as nationally, is losing those surveys. And I'm happy to report the surveys are on track this year. So they have adjusted and had protocols in place that aren't aren't dependent on vaccines they put quarantines in place and so far this year have been really successful up and down the west coast of actually implementing those surveys and actually it's it's interesting to see how just how happy the scientists were to actually get out on the ships and get back out on the ships and 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 pleased with that we think you know or initially we thought people would have a lot of apprehension for that but people are just dying to get back out on the water uh, and actually do those surveys uh, so that's actually been really good um you know, this upcoming year, I think it's going to be mixed. We're definitely got our focus on how do we get out of COVID? Uh, how do we actually move forward? Uh, like I said, the surveys are on track. Uh, observers are getting vaccinated. 94% of our observers are fully vaccinated. Uh, uh, you know, four or five percent more have single shot. And I think there's only 2% that don't have that aren't vaccinated right now. So we're working through that, but definitely some success there to to maintain the observing program. Last year, you know, and in, I know the observer program was a a challenge. We've had some uh, good, uh, robust discussions with the congressman on that issue. Um, I will say, you know, we did observe over 450 separate trips last year. Uh, we did not have a single case of an observer actually um, getting COVID from the observing. Other, there were two cases of sort of those big outbreaks with the industry, the big industry vessels uh, early on in the process, um, but really successful program of preventing that spread of COVID in the, in the protocols. And this year, we haven't had any uh, cases whatsoever in the programs moving forward. Um, fishing season wise, I'll just hit that a little bit. Salmon fishing, it's, uh, you know, and focused more on the Oregon coast. It's sort of a, a mix of things. We've definitely had some, you know, constraints because of Klamath stocks in the south on uh, Chinook, which really constrained the fisheries. We've had some constraints put in place because of the Washington coastal coho stocks. Um, and so that is constraining fisheries and, and salmon fisheries in some sense. But on the other hand, um, probably one of the best uh, predicted coho runs uh, coming into Columbia that we've had. Um, I think it's like the third highest on record. Um, so 1.6 million is the prediction. So the fisheries, the coho fisheries, and uh, it's be a boon to the recreational fishery as well around the Columbia. Um, I think it's like 260% of normal uh, for that fishery, 260% increase from last year on, on that fishery. So uh, definitely some benefits and some bright spots out there, but definitely some challenges as well as we move forward. Um, yeah. Another piece I'll hit, just the new administration coming in. Haven't seen a lot of big changes yet in terms of on the ground changes uh, with the new administration so far. Like uh, Congressman said, we're just getting NOAA leadership in place with uh, Dr. Spinrad hopefully be on. Uh, pretty soon we don't have a, we still have an acting assistant administrator for fisheries. Um, there's been a, a big focus on the executive orders that have come out and sort of what to do about that. I sort of, you know, the climate change and I just, you know, shorthand the 30 by 30. Uh, initiative uh, coming out of the administration. Uh, a lot of discussion there, um, and I think that discussion will continue. It's good to see that in the 30 by 30 uh, piece that the president and the agencies have really highlighted uh, the, the need to incorporate fishing community and fishing in that definition of conservation and how that's conducted. So I think that's a big bonus for us as you're you know, working with the council and the industry, providing input to the council as to how to move forward on that recognizes that not all fishing is the same, that there actually is conservation through like rock fish conservation areas or essential fish habitat that actually do provide substantial conservation on the West Coast and, and other areas. Um, wind is another one that's a, a big topic that's that's out there nationally. Um, it's been less, wind has been less of a topic on the West Coast, you know, over the past five years, but is really ramping up. So on the West Coast region and our two science centers, we're coordinating internally to have a wind team. Um, but also want to make sure that the input comes in from the council and the industry and others into that process. We're trying to avoid some of the pitfalls that they saw in, in New England uh, with wind sort of coming on the scene pretty hot and heavy there and trying to avoid uh, some of that by making sure we are coordinating closely with BOEM on what they are doing. Mostly it's really focused in California right now, uh, but I do know like the Oregon Land Conservation Development um, is out, we're also doing some outreach to look at Oregon wind as well. Um, but largely right now, there's a big focus on potential leases off the California coast uh, for that. Um, upcoming items, uh, you know, long-standing issues related to electronic monitoring and moving that program forward. That program is slated to go into effect uh, this upcoming January. 
Uh, we are putting out the new the guidelines uh, for the handbook for that implementation this week, I think, or this month. Um, so that's out there. There'll be some additional discussion at the council meeting in June on that. Um, we're working forward to expand that electronic monitoring program to include the bottom trawl and the non widening midwater trawl um, to make their, sure that's a robust program going forward. Um, we're also working through the uh, through the council process. We worked on a an analysis related to southern resident killer whales. Uh, this over the past eight year, 18 months, um, and what to do about killer whales in the in prey availability for killer whales in the salmon fisheries. Uh, we completed that process. The council has moved forward with Amendment 21, which would make some changes to the fishing regimes in low abundance years to help protect killer whales. Uh, that came out of the council, so we're in the final stages of processing that. We have a new biological opinion associated with that, and that process is moving forward and, and should be completed shortly as well on sort of the new action side. And then lastly, I'll just hit the, the staffing and workload side. I know that's always a concern on the ground fish side of staffing and workload and how we do that. We have seen some sort of, you know, gains and losses uh, related to COVID and other things of, of people, you know, staffing changes. We've done what we can to try to maintain that staffing, and we're backfilling positions as quickly as we can. Uh, where we have seen losses, I'll announce that um, Keely Kent, who has been in our groundfish program, will take over as the uh, permanent groundfish branch chief this week. Um, so that's a uh, great news to get some stability there. And we're also going to be hiring a, a senior policy position to focus on the catch share fisheries um, as well in the near future. So that'll actually provide some capacity support um, and some, some senior policy uh, support for our region uh, to help with the ground fish industry. We are, you know, reduced with the, with the staffing changes. We're probably, we estimated probably at 60% capacity for experienced reg riders right now and just trying to get some new people up, up to speed as, as those staffing changes um, and transitions occur. So that's, that's all I had. I'll maybe just turn it over to Ryan to see if he has any, uh, he's the expert on a lot of the council interactions, if he wants to add any more uh, at all or any more detail. Yeah, thanks, Barry. No, I think you you touched on, on on most of the kind of state of play from our end. I mean, I just would underscore, of course, we're, we're well aware of how uh, much the commercial and recreational fisheries uh, have been impacted by the pandemic. Um, that's not definitely not been lost on on NIMS and, and on the region. Uh, as Barry noted, you know we've we've dealt with our own challenges um, from a regional perspective. Uh, we've had some turnover, had some losses. Um, we've had to move some folks around, um, and we're 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 on track, and we're uh, we're gaining back some of that ground um, as of now. And then we, like Barry noted, we have some important uh, positions that will go out actually shortly hopefully in the next month or so um, to bring on some additional resources um, and the only other thing I'd add is is uh, you know I, I've definitely heard from a number of the communities and in and stakeholders that it would help to have some improved dialogue and communication and and so I am personally trying to make myself more available to um, to to do that and to hear well, what the needs are and concerns are from folks. Um, and so I really look forward to uh, hearing from the panelists and, and, and anyone else today. Thank you. So to that end, Ryan, if you could put your information in the chat room or whatever they, you call it, uh, that would be helpful and make sure Jory has it. So for those, uh, those of us that are a little technologically challenged, we can call Jory up and get that information. Uh, also, because the uh, communication is key, uh, you know, rumors go around and sometimes misinformation in this day and age, a lot of misinformation. So it'd be nice to have uh, access to that. And then we could also put, there's a common topic or issue out there. We could put that on our website. Uh, we're gonna go to uh, Heather next, but real quick, I just wanted to, from my own perspective, uh, you know, you alluded to it, Barry, but uh, what are, you know, the last administration, it was a lot of turnover. We never had a director, a consistent director, and and the staffing has been challenging. So where are we? Because the fleet here relies on a lot of these uh, folks to be in place to uh, get the regulations written, this and that. And so I guess where are we? Uh, so we can have realistic expectations as far as your staffing levels in terms of getting grants out and getting the regula regulations written in a timely manner. What we have 50, you said something about 60% on the grant side. What is that emblematic overall or? Yeah, maybe Ryan, do you want to cover just the ground fish program and then I'll just maybe hit the sort of broader region. Yeah, sorry, I was putting my information into the chat. Was this just about staffing and, and workload? Yeah, 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 for what, the ground fish program, can you sort of review like how many people we've had or what, yeah. how many people we currently have? 
Yeah, so I mean, historically, we've had about um, usually six FTEs and a supervisor. Um, and we've had uh, that's mostly been band three level employees with with band two and, and, and that in addition to a contractor. Um, that's been our typical we we did have some turnover, right? We lost our groundfish brand chief during the pandemic that it resulted in some of those senior staff stepping up into the acting position. So therefore, kind of a net loss. We had another person uh, that had to rotate over to help our permits side due to some losses over there and some um, very important uh, permits and monitoring issues that needed to be uh, done. Uh, but we have, we have now moved people around. We've got a, um, a couple of new hires and new contractors. We've, we're back now up to um, six full FTEs for the groundfish branch, including a contractor. So we're back to our current level of staffing and we will be bringing on this senior um, uh, band for non-supervisory catch shares lead that will augment the groundfish branch, but getting it to probably its largest size in the last five years here. We anticipate that announcement to go out uh, next month, uh, July, early July at the latest, uh, and hopefully onboarding someone by early fall, uh, getting us back to um, hopefully full strength on the groundfish side. Okay. Okay. Good. Good. Yeah, and Congressman, right. just adding, uh, just add, well, just to add to that, I say, you know, so we have prioritized, and people should know that we have prioritized within the Sustainable Fisheries Division to get the backfills in place for the ground fish program and to, and to keep that funding as stable as possible. That's different than you know, when we talk about other other programmers that are like our ESA consultation workload, where we don't, where on that side, we do have a, a staffing loss of, you know, 5% or 10%, you know, annually just based on cost of living and based on limited appropriations. And so on the permitting and regulatory side, on the salmon side, that's the part that's probably has been declining over time over the past couple of years. Um, but we, in order to prioritize some of the sustainable fisheries uh, side of things as well. All right, that helpful for me, give me perspective and advocate, advocate uh, to beef that up obviously in this upcoming budget then. Uh, well, let's go to Heather, uh, Midwater, Midwater uh, Trawlers uh, Fleet and talk a little bit about the COVID-19 experience. Uh, uh, what we learned, the vaccines, the testing. Heather and I talked often in those early days. Go ahead, Heather. Yeah, thanks, Congressman. Um, I wanted to just start with, you know, thanking you for continuing to do these outreach um, roundtables. They're really important, I think, for the fishing industry. Give a shout out to um, Jory, who I've uh, spent some time with already and gotten to know, which is great. And just a thank you to your staff, in particular Huck, who's always um, available and helpful when we need him. And, and that's just really comforting in a time of turmoil to know that you can just reach out and, and get help. So that's, that's great. I also um, want to thank Barry and Ryan. Ryan has been meeting with members of the industry on a regular basis and opening up communication. And, and I think that those meetings have been mutually beneficial. And so we really um, do appreciate that. So in terms of COVID, um, you know, our experience here has been a little bit mixed. Uh, last year during the, the start of the pandemic, took a lot of effort um, on my part and others to get fishermen tested. Uh, we wanted to get fishermen tested before Pacific whiting season starts on May 15th. And uh, so the boat owners knew that with quarantining, they'd have um, nobody sick on the boat and the boat would not be sidelined. And while the state of Oregon had deemed fishermen essential workers, they um, weren't able to be tested because they didn't have symptoms. And so it was kind of this catch 22, it spent several weeks, um, your office helped out. I worked with OHA and Lincoln Public Health, Lincoln County Public Health. And we were finally able to get a two day um, testing clinic set up for all the Pacific Whiting uh, crew members to get tested and, and that worked out um, you know, really well. What kind of undermined that though was as soon as the season started within a couple of days, the US Coast Guard who we love and who save our lives um, were doing routine boardings on vessels and they were jumping from vessel to vessel including some of the larger factory trawlers in the whiting sector who eventually did have um, COVID outbreaks. And so that seemed to be a disconnect. And at the time I had called John on your staff and he helped me get a message out, uh, not so much telling the Coast Guard obviously what to do, but kind of in educating them on the uh, amount of money and time and quarantining that these vessels had gone through in order, in order to be safe. I do know that this year, uh, most of the fishermen in Newport who want to be vaccinated are vaccinated. 
vaccinations have been really available in Lincoln County. Right. Um, in fact, there's another uh, one geared just toward fishermen and seafood plant workers coming up in June. And that's the J and J vaccine. So you only need one shot, which is great for folks that are hard to get back um, in for that second shot because they're working. I will say that the hake season started or the whiting season started on May 15th. And um, I just checked this morning and there has not been that same routine boardings by the US Coast Guard that has happened in, in the past. And so that's that's really good. In terms of the CARES Act funding, um, I haven't spent a lot of time you know, working on that, except making the information available to uh, the, the people that want it, um, and then encouraging them, you know, both with the PPP loans and CARES Act, you know, working with their accountants and others versus working through a trade association. But what I do know and will say that the state of Oregon, uh, Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, uh, very organized um, through the process, always able to get uh, help from them or direction on where to go. Same with your office, making it easy for people to navigate the process uh, for the most part and much more timely than some of the other states that we operate in. And so I think that that was really important. And then, um, you know, COVID related shutdowns at processing plants were challenging. Uh, I do know that the plants have spent a lot of money implementing protections and doing their best to keep um, fishing activity going. Last year, we faced some instances where boats were literally on their way in with a full hold and the plant suddenly had to shut down and people were scrambling to find other places to unload. But everybody came together and really worked um, to make that happen. And that's really important for the trawl fleet in particular, um, you know, the fishing industry, uh, in particular, the ground fish trawl industry is a year round fishery and we help keep infrastructure, shoreside infrastructure in place so that we can um, also have that infrastructure to process the more seasonal fisheries like crab and shrimp and tuna and salmon when we have it. And so having everybody healthy and playing their part is, is really important. And I wanted to just spend the balance of my uh, short time, Congressman, on something that COVID has made really clear. And you've helped us with this in the past, but um, it has to do with electronic monitoring and, and Barry mentioned it earlier. And what we have with electronic monitoring is really um, a potential sea change in the opportunity to reduce costs in the trawl industry, which is 200% monitored, uh, which means 100% on the water, 100% on shore, all on our dime. Um, this is way more than any other West Coast fishery. And during the COVID pandemic and prior to the vaccinations, there were a lot of serious concerns from trawl vessels and others about human observers, you know, adding another body to a small working space, um, but recognizing, you know, important information is collected from monitoring. Um, most of the whiting boats already are, were using EM under um, exempted, exempted fishing permits. And so they didn't have those same concerns as others from the COVID standpoint. Um, but what we have found and what COVID has really made clear um, is that we need a non-invasive, effective and inexpensive way to monitor all of our fisheries, not just the trawl fleet. Um, and as Barry mentioned, the EM program right now is poised to move into federal regulations. Um, but it's not the program that we want. And we've been trying to work with NIMS on that. Um, and in fairness to the region's leadership, to Barry and Ryan, you know, I believe that they're really caught between a rock and a hard place. Uh, the hard place is the industry and me, and, and the rock is NIMS headquarters, who refuses to budge on implementing this program that we don't like and we're afraid is gonna, gonna fail. Um, and so we'd really like to see if you could help us there in terms of, um, getting a program that's cost effective and meets the objectives that EM is for and is a model that we can then use in other, um, in other fisheries as well. And then I'll just wrap up with the report that NIMS just came out with and that is um, the fisheries status reports and Astoria and Newport are in the top 20 uh, in the nation for ports for commercial fishing landings. We consistently are but we still have challenges that remain, um, you know, expense in the trawl industry. We still have a balance of $12 million on the buyback loan. 
We um, thank you and your office for your Herculean efforts over the years uh, to help us remove $6 million in uh, interest that was additional that shouldn't have been there. Um, but we still have a lot of expense. We have ocean bills and wind energy and all kinds of things coming. So we wanna to continue to partner with you. Our, our first though is, is see if we can get the EM program and continue to work on the other things. And, and on behalf of myself and, and Oregon Trawlers, I just wanna thank you um, for your efforts and just your continued support of this really important industry. Thanks. Well, thank you, Heather. And thanks for all the work you've done. You do, you've done Herculean work over the last year, year and a half, trying to navigate COVID and all the different, you know, rules and regulations out there and trying to keep the fleet as, as active and in play as possible. I was glad that they were declared essential. Uh, that was a big, big deal and uh, a lot of folks that continue to feed their families and frankly, keep the food chain alive here in the United States. That's a, that's a big deal. That gets overlooked by a lot of folks in the city, but uh, you know, the reason that uh, we're able to still go to the grocery store and get you know food and produce and stuff is because of the efforts of a lot of you all out there. And I, I for one, really, really appreciate it. Let's stay in touch on those federal regulations. Let's make sure that uh, Jory and I are up to speed in the differences between what you're looking for uh, as the fleet and what uh, uh, the headquarters is thinking is the best thing for you since sliced bread. And we can come up with maybe uh, uh, some, uh, some language that, that we might be able to work going forward, work with Barry and the rest of the team also uh, in that regard. So. Uh, that's a, that, well, we want to get that right. This has been an ongoing battle for years, as you alluded to, and it could be a big cost saver, uh, as well as a great way to efficiently monitor what's really going on uh, in the fleet and in the water out there that would help uh, NOAA long terms. But let's get it right, uh, or as close to right as we can to start with. Well, let's go, uh, let's go to the Trawl Commission, I guess. Uh, Elena, uh, why don't you give us a Little update on market pricing and what what the CARE Act uh, CARES Act maybe has worked for you or or not so much as the case may be. Thank you, Congressman. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for letting us speak today and share the news from um, our industry. To echo on what Heather already said, um, I don't want to repeat, but with a COVID impact, I'd like to focus a little bit on the market impact. Um, we last year, our as congressman, you are very well aware, our markets pretty much evaporated overnight. Unfortunately, it was a very hard uh, position to be in, together with the escalating costs to the processors, to the fishermen, no markets, and depressed, of course, ex vessel pricing continuously depressed going into this year, it's even worse. Who we, we didn't think last year that there, it was possible, well, it is. And last year, we also had a significantly cheaper diesel. This year that makes, I hear from vessels that just cannot fish. They can't be break even if they go fish at certain level at a certain volume but our markets are still in a, not in the shape where we are hoping them to be. Um, positive news, and I will let Lori still to talk more about it, but we got the USDA um, approval for our purchase request, total of $17 million. Congressman, thank you for your support on that. Really appreciate it. It's a historic purchase for seafood and certainly historic for West Coast commercial fishing industry and our sector specifically. Really excited about it. Uh, the industry is thrilled. It's a light at the end of the tunnel and a breath of the air we all need. Um, and we've worked with Lori together in collaboration. Really, Lori is the champion. So I'll let her speak more to that effort. Um, as far as the um, depressed markets and challenges we have marketing our products, the industry is in, not in a great shape to be able to support marketing initiatives really well at the moment. And we haven't been for some time. And now, as you can imagine, things are significantly worse. There isn't much options for external funding 
such as grants for marketing specifically. And that's very challenging. There is SK grants that we are grateful with Positively Groundfish. They got it second time. Again, thank you for your support on that. It is, I personally uh, doubt, I hope we will get it third time, but I'm not gonna hold my breath. I'm gonna be searching for additional funding opportunities, but there isn't many. If there is anything that can be done uh, to help the US seafood and fishing industry with additional seed funding, so to speak, to start those uh, efforts to promote the products domestically, regionally and locally, that would come a long way. Um, prices, Jory asked me to mention that came up in our discussion with her uh, a couple of weeks ago. With the X vessel prices continuing to drop, surprisingly, I personally didn't notice any difference at the retail level. I don't know what's the what's the exactly the reason. I know in our industry, from uh, fishermen to processors, everyone is taking a hit, and the products are sold considerably cheaper, depending on the species, some more, some less. But then you go to the grocery store and you look at the uh, shrimp previously frozen from last year and it's, it's very expensive. It was at some point I saw it at local in Brookings Fredmeyer. It was $9.99 when we were stuck with a horrendous amount of inventory and the prices just kept collapsing. So, but that's the vague supply chain past our industry. Um, and I'm sure the retail also taken here. So, with the CARES Act um, initiative last year, I, I want to thank ODFNW and Pacific States for doing a fabulous job in quickly getting the funding to the industry. It's really much appreciated on behalf of the industry. There's great feedback um, about it from folks. It, was, it really helped out to keep our crews working. As you know, it's not that easy to uh, find um, folks, many willing folks to work on the um, deck of the boat and uh, that helped. It helped with the gear, gear is very expensive. Mostly it, the money got to everyone. There was just a few trawlers I'm aware of who were not unfortunately able to qualify because of the criteria that was set. Um, so they were excluded and the folks were part of the industry for decades, finally invested in their own vessels and then COVID happened and they were short couple months. Um, one of those fishermen also purchased another vessel going into COVID and the bank delayed um, essentially the, the loan. So the fishermen got stuck with the insurance uh, payments for a number of months and that sounds like he may not again qualify with the second vessel. If there is anything that can be done to accommodate those fishermen who really need it but got left out, that would be greatly appreciated. I don't wanna run over my time. I feel I am, Jory, just give me a little flag. I don't wanna lose track of uh, other speakers. And um, lastly, I would like to mention the um, USDA and NOAA uh, collaboration development. So I noticed that it sounds like there is a position being filled for um, a statistician in marketing related for the seafood and that's being done in collaboration with USDA and that's phenomenal. We've been talking about it for a couple of years uh, that the seafood typically is a chop liver um, for USDA because we're under Commerce Department Authority. However, that, with that in mind, that's why we're being left out of a few grants and uh, marketing opportunity for non-regulatory services under USDA. And granted, um, to give credit to USDA leadership, they, did, they have been reaching out uh, with uh, round tables and uh, listening sessions, including to the seafood industry to better understand the needs. So my fingers are gonna be crossed for further collaboration. It would help tremendously if seafood world, fishing world could have access to the same non-regulatory services of USDA as any other land agricultural product. 
Um, if, there, if there's anything that can be done to encourage that development, that would be great. And uh, we will do our part and keep our finger on the pulse. And hopefully one day we will even see organic wild caught uh, US seafood. <laughs> and I would good. like, I would like to thank you, Congressman, and your staff in always being so instrumental for our industry. As Heather mentioned, um, you guys are always there to pick up the phone when we call with issues and um, help us get to where we hopefully need to be. And thank you. It's an ongoing process, a uh, collaborative partnership. Uh, and appreciate what you're doing. Uh, we'll uh, put a little extra attention on tracking uh, that USDA position, uh, trying to make sure that comes to full fruition. Uh, and to your earlier comment, you know, we oftentimes the federal government in tough times buys uh, produce from farmers. Why can't we do a little of that from our fishing industry also? It's nice to see we're starting to realize that uh, uh, our fisheries are every bit a, 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 a key natural resource uh, enterprise that needs to be supported here in this country. One thing we learned out of this pandemic is that you need to be a little more self-sufficient in this country. And uh, the men and women in this fleet do a great job of making sure that we're not relying on just foreign sources for our, our food sources. So it, that's huge. That's very, very huge. And uh, so let's just uh, stay linked up, uh, see what we can do in terms of partnering here. Uh, Lori, uh, you got teed up here. Uh, you get a chance to talk a little bit about uh, this whole uh, last year from the seafood processor standpoint. What a challenge. Holy smokes. Yeah, yes, indeed. I'm, I've been reflecting back to your roundtable we had just about one year ago, um, you know, where we kind of talked about we, all of these issues and how now here we are a year later and what a learning process it has been. Um, I want to thank you so much for continuing these roundtables. It's always so nice to be able to engage with you and your staff. Thanks, Jory, for putting this together and for reaching out. Um, it's been great to get to know Jory. Um, we had, uh, we processors um, who I represent had a great meeting with Huck earlier uh, uh, this spring. So just thanks for everything and your continued support. Um, I want to just sort of try not to echo or repeat everything that Heather and Yelena have already said. Um, and Yelena provided such a great segue um, into um, some of the issues related to the USDA. Um, just a quick recap. I mean, the processing, the seafood processors have had a really tough year, um, as you know. Um, we... Uh, processors have to pay fishermen to keep fishing. We have to pay our workers to stay working. Um, we have to pay to process, package, transport, and distribute the fish. And then we need to be able to sell it. And when the pandemic hit, um, we lost our markets virtually overnight for about 70% of seafood. We became painfully aware um, that most people don't eat seafood at home. Uh, you know, it's mostly eaten in restaurants. So we kind of have really struggled through this year. I remember asking you last year for support on getting the USDA to purchase some of our seafood. I want to thank you for that support. We had a letter from uh, 10 of our West Coast congressional delegates, um, all three West Coast state senators or senators from all three West Coast states, and a tremendous amount of support to get uh, an announcement last week that the USDA is going to purchase $17 million of our seafood. Um, this includes uh, pink shrimp, rockfish, and whiting. Um, and this is really just the beginning. Um, we are super excited about this, um, and so is the USDA. Um, and that's really been one of the great things about this. You know, like, uh, like Elena said, um, because we're managed under the Department of Commerce, fishermen aren't haven't always been considered by the USDA like farmers. And we have not been, um, you know, provided the same opportunities and the same um, relief through this pandemic. Um, so it was certainly a learning process for us to understand how to engage with the USDA. And it's been a learning process for the USDA. And they're really excited about it. 
um, we're excited about this relationship to be able to provide a long-term opportunity to help stabilize some of our markets. Um, this is a great uh, amount of relief that we're getting right now for, for starters, but this isn't going to fix everything. You know, it's not going to fix all of the issues that Yelena talked about with these markets because um, we're, you know, reeling from the impacts of this pandemic and it's going to take a long time to rebuild. Um, but what this opportunity with the USDA will do is give us, uh, you know, a quick overflow, um, overflow valve, you know, that we can get in the door and start working with them and then help us to stabilize our other markets um, so that we can increase the prices and so that we can provide some really much needed support for our infrastructure. Um, beyond that, um, we're also providing uh, food security for our country. Um, so this is really a win-win situation. Uh, the USDA, um, working with them has been a lot of work, um, but it has been well worth it. And we are excited to move forward on that. Um, I did want to quickly uh, cover the CARES Act and thank you very much uh, for your support and for that relief funding. Um, I have worked with all three states on the CARES Act process, um, Washington, Oregon, and California. All of the companies that I represent qualified. All of the seafood processors experienced more than 35% losses in revenues last year. Um, and through that process, I wanna thank uh, Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, the state of Oregon, the process was really fair. Um, really well managed and certainly the most equitable of the uh, CARES Act processes that I've worked in across all three states. Okay. <clears throat> and I want to echo all of Heather's comments uh, about the support that we've received um, from the state of Oregon. Excuse me. Um, and just for comparison, um, we are still waiting for round one money in the state of Washington. Um, none of the companies have received any money from round one yet. Oh my God. Uh, yeah, it's been, it's been rough. Um, so I really appreciate that. We're looking forward to round two and um, the staff has really been great to work with. Um, I'm, uh, I'm happy as we move forward to answer questions about the USDA process because I think a lot of people are wondering how it's all going to work. But I guess what I can say is we, the processors, are doing all of the work up front with the USDA to get ourselves certified and get, we have to get these products specified as USDA commodities. There's a lot of technical work to be done and we're doing all of that. And once, it, once this is started, we're in the door and off and running. And I think this 17 million is just the beginning. So we're really excited about that. Um, the last thing I wanted to touch on um, uh, so that we can save time for other folks is um, how important uh, it is going to be over the course of this next year or a few years um, to support our infrastructure in our coastal communities. Um, one of the things that we learned very painfully again from this pandemic is that outside of frontline workers, um, the fishing and seafood industry is really one of the only sources of full-time uh, employment in a lot of our rural coastal communities. And we um, really need some support on our infrastructure. Um, we need to look towards um, building and uh, repairing our infrastructure and creating more sustainable and more environmentally friendly infrastructure as we move forward. All of our processors are renewing their 900J DEQ wastewater permits this year. This has been an ongoing process for at least the six years that I've been here. And this is going to cost some companies millions of dollars. Um, so this is another major impact that we're facing, but um, I'm looking forward at legislation that's coming out of Congress and I'm seeing things like um, the Water Quality Protection and Job Creation Act. Um, that was introduced by Congressman DeFazio. And I'm seeing opportunities where we can provide um, support for the repair and maintenance of our shoreside infrastructure. I think it's gonna be a huge issue in Newport. Um, so I really, I, I'm gonna follow up with your staff on that and see okay. where we can maybe um, find some projects to support in your district because I see this as another win-win 
um, just like the USDA, the more that we can support our infrastructure and the more that we can uh, build infrastructure for the long term, um, we can, uh, you know, also save, you know, conserve the environment and help uh, address a lot of the things in President Biden's um, executive order tackling the climate crisis. It all relates and it all relates to building uh, and investing in long term infrastructure and ensuring that we have jobs um, in our coastal communities. Um, there are a number of other issues, as you're aware of, the, um, and I, I'm going to stop because I'm assuming other folks will want to talk about, um, you know, some of those things related to the climate legislation that may be coming forward, the 30 by 30, uh, you know, the report that we just saw from the administrations on 30 by 30, and certainly uh, wind and the uh, development of offshore wind projects is going to be, I think, a huge issue moving forward. So thank you again for your support on everything. Um, I'm looking forward to continuing to work with you and your staff. You have one of the best staffs I've ever worked with. So we really appreciate your support. Well, thanks, Laura. I appreciate that. Appreciate it big time. Uh, and to some of your comments, uh, I think we've got a very good uh, uh, line of communication with USDA. Uh, Count Tom Vilsack, the secretary, a friend, uh, worked with him in a prior incarnation, uh, and he understands rural America like very few members of uh, any administration that, uh, you know, centered more on the urban and suburban centers of our country. And uh, but Tom gets it, and uh, this would be a great opportunity to frankly build, as I listen to you all, a head of steam towards the next farm bill. Uh, it'd be nice that fisheries have a more prominent role. I worked hard uh, when I first came to Congress to give forestry uh, a bigger seat at that table and it pay, has paid off uh, in many ways. I would like to do that with fisheries. Uh, as we talk about the statistician, the buy programs, all these types of things, uh, create a, uh, a, a more uh, ingrained ongoing uh, sense of uh, the role that our fisheries play uh, with folks uh, in this country. And uh, again, the pandemic uh, the, the showed how important it is. And frankly, to your comment, I mean, the real answer to the markets is to reopen businesses, you know, get our restaurants open, uh, get trade going again, you know, overseas with China. I mean, that, those are the two biggies. We get that done. Then I think the future is bright, given the resiliency that I've seen in the fleet and the processing community. Uh, so I'm going to be pressing the governor big time, uh, uh, President too, for that matter, uh, about uh, making sure that uh, come July, America is open. That requires all of us to get our vaccinations. Please, guys, gals, let's get our vaccinations, man. This, this should not be an ideological thing. This is just protecting you, your families, the community, the country, and getting us back to normal, man. That's I just want to get back to normal. I'm tired of these damn masks. Uh, but anyway, uh, I, a question before you run, Lauren, then go, I, I'm holding things up, that's bad, Kurt, uh, but I want to ask any other questions later. Uh, where are we, uh, you alluded to the challenges the processes have had, and uh, you know, what, where are we with the, the employment levels within the processing community at this point in time, and how are the workers handling things, and what do you see going forward? Um, well, thanks for asking that. I mean, there's just so many issues um, and certainly labor, uh, retaining labor is super challenging. Um, over the course of the pandemic, for all of the reasons, you know, and, and also because of a lot of the federal assistance programs, um, we really struggled to keep labor. Um, you know, I've heard that from a lot of folks. Yeah, I, I mean, in a lot of, in a lot of cases and, you know, it was, it was just, you know, people could stay home and make money, you know, enough money to stay home and seafood processing is not easy work. Um, you know, on top of that, we had, you know, we did go through a lot of disruptions last year um, from the pandemic. Um, and it was very difficult to keep workforces, um, you know, year round or seasonally even. You know, now we are entering the beginning of the whiting season and we are struggling to get our workforce um, up to full full speed. Um, beyond that, of course, you know, we're still um, 
keeping everybody safe and healthy. We've distanced everybody out on the processing floors, um, which has slowed down production, um, you know, moved people out, you know, everybody's got tons of PPE. There's been tons of costs associated with that. Um, and we are working very hard to get our workforce vaccinated. So it has just been, it's been a very big challenge. And all of these things, of course, ultimately increase costs, um, yes. which affect prices, you know. Um, but these are all things that we're working through. We have an unbelievably resilient um, and adaptable uh, uh, industry. And we're bringing uh, as many into the workforce as we can. Um, the more we can stabilize our fisheries and the more we can stabilize our infrastructure, the more we're gonna be able to provide year round opportunities for employment. And that's what we're looking to do. Um, so it, again, these are, these are challenges that are not going to be conquered overnight. We're looking at long-term issues here. Well, make sure you stay in touch with us on the infrastructure piece vis-a-vis -vis our fishing community because uh, Peter and I are working really hard to make sure that the, the fishing, fishing communities are, are part of that opportunity. So if there's certain wording, certain language that we need to make sure is in the, some of these bills, please let us know. Absolutely. Well, let, Thank you. Yeah. Well, let's go to Karen. Uh, I know the crabbing uh, uh, fleet is very interested in knowing uh, what's going on with whale and tagging, but some of the stuff that's happening in California, some of the regulations that are being promulgated. I, I for one, am very interested. I remember this being uh, teed up uh, last time we chatted and uh, all the preventative work you guys tried to do and just give us all a sense of where we are right now. What, what's what's going to be happening, Karen? Yeah, I'm happy to join you all and thanks for having me. And uh, Tim and others can weigh in and help me explain this issue and our status so far. This has been a very group effort to deal with this uh, new challenge in the fishery. And, uh, you know, it really did um, start before the California problem became a, a crisis in 2019. It's been multiple years now that we've had this increased level of entanglement in the uh, crab fishery. Oregon has a piece of it. The biggest piece is in California, but we all have a part to play in, in solving that problem. So um, our approach in Oregon has been to try our best to be very stri strategic with our efforts to uh, further shape the fishery so that we can maximize harvest and uh, still protect and conserve whales as needed. And so it's been a, one of those balancing acts of trying to achieve both things at the same time. Um, and uh, the group effort would not have been successful without a lot of really difficult discussions with industry uh, and really hard choices that have been made. So uh, where we are right now is that we're in year one of uh, a three-year trial in regulations for the Dungeness crab fishery in Oregon. And these um, focus on reducing uh, crab pots in areas and in times when we uh, have also documented increases in whales. And the whales that we're most particularly uh, concerned about uh, are humpback whales that are migrating into our waters offshore Oregon uh, to feed during the late spring and summer months. And so it's those months where we have the, the highest risk, the most likelihood of having co-occurrence of uh, gear in the water and whales that are foraging and amongst that gear. So starting May 1st, the industry uh, agreed to reduce pot limits, uh, pot limit assignments uh, by 20%, which is a big hit, uh, and do that uh, with only deploying gear inside of 40 fathoms. And, and humpback whales in particular prefer deeper waters. And so by bringing gear inside 40 fathoms and reducing the amount uh, uh, some were trying to really reduce that co-occurrence. So we'll be doing this in Oregon this year, next year, and 2023, and working uh, to understand 
the fishery effort information and continuing to collaborate uh, with researchers in the industry and figuring out how this is impacting uh, both our, our whale conservation goals as well as the fishery uh, uh, economic vitality goals, if you will. Um, I wanna give a shout out to the Oregon Dungeness Crab Commission in particular, who early on invested in uh, pilot project research to look at whale distribution that's very critical to these regulations we just put in place. Without that research, uh, which was uh, subsequently invested in by NOAA through Section 6 funds, uh, without that research, we wouldn't have been able to strategically identify the 40 fathom curve, 30 fathom curve as being a really effective uh, way to structure our regulations. Um, so that was great. Um, and you yourself are supporting an extension of that, pro of that project uh, through the new community uh, project funding process. So I really appreciate and speak for industry and the Crab Commission, uh, as well as the OSU researchers and continuing to support that work um, through proposing that uh, to Congress, your colleagues in Congress. Um, so research like that is really critical. Without the information, we cannot have strategic management approaches. And that means that we have to have blunt uh, management, which ends up having more impacts on fisheries uh, and that harvest activity. So they really go hand in hand. Our effectiveness at understanding the problem and developing management makes it less uh, harsh on constraining harvest activities, which means they can be more uh, uh, vibrant and, and uh, fruitful. So um, with that, uh, I think that the key next step for us, you know, all I've been talking about is state regulations, uh, but the state regulations are being developed um, as a foundation for uh, an application to NOAA for an incidental take permit uh, for incidental take of humpback whales, blue whales, and uh, leatherback sea turtles. And that conservation plan is in development now and will be submitted, our target is to submit it by the end of 2021. And uh, the relationship between the department and NOAA in developing that conservation plan has been great. It's been a, a very iterative, uh, helpful process and uh, the regulations that we worked on so closely with industry really are the core and the, the foundation of that approach, uh, adding to that an ongoing monitoring need um, and uh, ongoing evaluation and adaptation of our regulatory approach need. So those things are being built in this year. Um, the conservation plan is just one on the West Coast, both California and Washington are in their process to develop that, that uh, type of plan and working with uh, NIMFS as well on those. So we'll have a, an integrated West Coast approach to uh, trying to keep the Dungeness crab fishery on the water and, uh, and fruitful for years to come. Uh, it is one of the significant bread and butter fisheries of the West Coast, and so we don't want to see it wither um, from excess regulation. Uh, we want to protect the whales, we want to protect the fishery, and, and have that work for decades. So that's my update, and, and happy to take questions, but also defer to the expertise on the call to add in additional thoughts on that, um, and appreciate the time to share our updates. Just real one more, again, question, privilege question of, you know, how, what were the whale entanglements uh, off the Oregon coast last year and so far this year? So far this year, uh, we haven't had any humpback whales. Um, there's uh, been one um, identified for a, a minke whale. Uh, last year, I think our number was one, and I should have that number off the top of my head, but essentially we have had zero, one, or two humpback whale entanglements for the last 10 years. And so while every entanglement is something we want to avoid, it is a significantly low, rare uh, number, rare event. And that really poses some challenges in managing it because uh, at the beginning of the season, 
uh, for the Oregon Dungeness crab fishery, we deploy as a state approximately 115,000 pots. And in the course of the season, we fish that gear uh, to raise uh, approximately $50 million in X vessel value, which then trickles through our communities and, and drives a really significant economic yeah. engine. Mm -hmm. And from all of that activity, one entanglement occurs, uh, you know, one to two. And so we can't, we can't compare the two, the apples to oranges, but it is, it puts in context the economic act activity on the one hand and the conservation problem on the other hand, and they're both important, but it is, it is a, it's a challenge to try and, and find a, an appropriate sized uh, solution to that. Oh, just lost to everybody. Uh, well, that my, my point for the question is my understanding uh, that as we develop a, a framework going forward, uh, we want to be cognizant of the fact that we don't want to do overkill. We want to be proactive to avoid the problem. Uh, but one, you know, one whale is a testament to the fact you're doing something very right. The fleet is doing something very right. And, you know, we're worried about whales moving in closer to shore because of all the ocean, you know, changes out there. I get that. But, uh, and my two cents as a legislator, I want my team and you guys to follow. We don't necessarily have to do everything California does uh, or Washington. Uh, God bless them. Uh, but they have a very different view of fisheries. And frankly, they're a bigger source of the problem and would respectfully suggest they maybe have to do a few things that we may not have to do if we continue to do the smart proactive management that ODF, W and uh, the fleet are doing right now. Anyway, enough editorializing. Well, let's go to questions. Uh, Jory, I'm gonna have you- um, Mr. Congressman, I just wanted to throw in one thing because we would be remiss if we didn't thank our partners <laughs> with the yes, uh, US yes. Coast Guard uh, who, who have helped us keep our costs down with the aerial surveys, they allow us to uh, okay. to fly along with them, and and uh, I, I just uh, I I just want to make sure that we give a hearty thank you to uh, to the guys uh, who fly us around. So that's a, that was my only add in there. But uh, Karen, thank you very much. And oh, thanks, yeah, very thanks for the ad, Jim. Very important ad. I appreciate that. Yeah, you guys got a lot at stake, and I appreciate as a legislator and someone that loves the fisheries and uh, appreciates all the conservation efforts to make sure the fisheries continue, both for the crab as well as the industry. Uh, you guys do an amazing work, really appreciate it. So I'm gonna turn it over to Jory to uh, uh, answer uh, or, or recognize folks that have questions. You guys all know the little chat room thing. And if you don't, you can just raise your hand and Jory will keep track of uh, your order. Jory? All right, I think I saw Bob first and then Mike's going to be on deck. Hi, uh, Bob Reese here, Northwest Guys and Anglers Association. Thanks for holding the round table. I'm on the banks, uh, not the banks, but the boat uh, on the boat of the Columbia River. We're fishing for spring chinook today. Uh, had, a, had a hold of uh, four, landed a couple. They were wild. We let, let them go. We're up at uh, the Bonneville Reach of the river. I just want to recognize uh, Congressman Trainer the work that you've done on uh, pet and pet and, and sport fishery interaction legislation. That's uh, uh, so far this year under the new permit, we've uh, removed 49 sea lions. 20 of them are the stellar sea lions that were interacting with the sturgeon, actually taking the sturgeon off the spawning ground, which has degraded the recruitment of juveniles into the population. So thank you for that that work in particular, helping save salmon and the lamb and also the Columbia. And uh, just really want to reiterate the, the value of this sport fishery, a multi-billion dollar industry on the Columbia River, uh, representing one of the greatest transfers of wealth from rural to urban communities. And uh, just plead that uh, in some capacity, you can work with Congressman um, Mike Simpson of Idaho to help uh, figure out a solution to the Snake River salmon crisis. Um, the salmon decline in the Snake River has huge implications for the production of Columbia River salmon up and down the West Coast. It's been something that myself and my colleagues, I'm fishing with Buzz Ramsey today, and we've been working on this for two and a half decades with no solution in sight. Congressman Simpson is bringing some some uh, 
sensible stuff to the table, some other things that other, other folks are having some heartburn over, but the, the bottom line is that we need a solution to this crisis on the Snake River. And uh, given your historic investment in fisheries on the West Coast, we hope that you can engage in this conversation in some capacity. Appreciate that, Bob. Uh, glad to see you out and about and enjoying hopefully uh, good fishing today. And, uh, you know, we're very aware of uh, Congressman Simpson's efforts and applaud him for, you know, keeping the dialogue open and alive. And, uh, it seems like uh, uh, congressmen and women on the Pacific Coast are all taking note. And uh, along with the, uh, the spill agreement that was brokered, I hope we continue to work in a very collaborative uh, uh, arrangement to uh, come up with a solution that, that raises all boats, no pun intended. Uh, that would be uh, the ideal solution. I think that's very doable. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, Mike. Yep, go, go for it, Mike. Well, thank you for the opportunity and uh, thank you for continuing to host these roundtables. They're very good. Uh, I would also like to thank you, Congressman, for your support and your staff's support for the fishing industry. And three outstanding ladies that I've come to know pretty well, uh, Heather Mann, I've known a long time, Lori, a little less, but six years anyway, and uh, then Yelena. So uh, the amount of work they put out is, is incredible, and the amount of good they do is incredible as well. I've heard a lot of positive things here today. And I, I, we've got a lot to be thankful for in that regard. I, I do want to take us a little bit different direction. It's, um, I'm just going to ask a, a question that not everybody likes to hear, but what steps are we going to take on the West Coast to avoid the conflict the East Coast fishing, fishing industry is having with offshore wind development? Yeah. In that, what role will NOAA fisheries play uh, to protect fisheries and their service? Barry or Ryan want to take a stab at that from your perspective? Yeah, no, and thanks. That, and Mike, that's a great question. And I think that's something we've been troubled with at trying to figure out, you know, based on the East Coast with the sort of wind coming forward to the West Coast. So a couple of things we are doing. One, on the regional office side, convening our regional teams, we mostly work on the permitting side with our protected resources folks, you know, whales, uh, you know, sea turtles, other things like that. Um, so engaging up and down the coast on on that piece of it. So we have across across the region a team um, moving forward there. We've been actively coordinating with the two science centers, um, who are also we put together some initial uh, work on what the potential effects might be of wind in the different areas, um, with surveys and thinking through that piece as well, sort of as internal work. And then we've started uh, meeting with the Boehm regional leadership uh, to also coordinate with Boehm as well. So that's our on the on the no fisher side, I'd also say on the council side um, of trying to make sure there is, I and mean, one of the things that's been really important to me is to make sure there is good input from industry and others into that process. And I know um, through the sort of Roto West Coast group, there's some some entities that are engaged in that process, uh, but trying to figure out better ways we can actually get incorporation of, of feedback and input through the council process and get Bowen through the, into the council process as well to engage in that um, as it picks up. But definitely trying to track as quickly as we can, figure out how we can get resources in place so we can actually track it and move forward on the permitting and, and sizing that and get information out to folks. Well, and I would say uh, I'd like to see Oregon and the coastal community step up. And we chatted last time about coming up with some sort of uh, coastal plan uh, for how that region develops. Uh, Right now, Bohm just does whatever it wants to do. It's a uh, it's a response organization, basically. Someone says, "I want to lease some offshore, you know, uh, property or or have a offshore access," and they just process that application. And it's not like they're making a judgment as a good or bad. They're just a regulatory, literally a regulatory agency. And what we need to do, and we talked about this last, well, maybe a year, year and a half ago now, and I know you're. The county commissioners in our uh, uh, Central Oregon Coast are very interested in this. Uh, we need to, I think, develop our own coastal plan uh, in advance for where we think certain uh, certain assets should go. Well, you know, where are the fisheries? 
Uh, where do these, these uh, wave buoys go? Where do the offshore wind things? Are? If we can be proactive as a state and as a community, a coastal community, and establish you know, a plan that is recognized by the state of Oregon, well, I don't necessarily have to acknowledge that, but it would help me help you guys in Congress to rain boom in to where they do have to pay attention to existing land and ocean use plans that are out there before they go citing things all over the place. So we really need to get our act together here in the state of Oregon. Uh, I know uh, uh, your state reps, your state senators are all over this, be very interested in helping. And I'd be glad to help convene a, a, a forum if that's what's necessary. Uh, to make sure that this occurs. But I think that to me, Mike, is the key uh, to being able to not necessarily push back, but to make sure whatever occurs is because some entrepreneur sees, you know, an opportunity to put some wind towers out there in the middle of the goddamn ocean. But uh, there's been some forethought about how that's going to affect the fisheries or the crab or the whales or whoever at, at that point in time. So I'd love to work with the community on this. Uh, 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 now that we're getting out of COVID, maybe it's appropriate to start having that discussion again. Congressman, I couldn't agree with you more in the forum. I think that that's a great idea, so thank you. Perfect, all right. So I think next on the list was Lori. Thank you, and um, I jumped in after I saw Mike raise his hand because I knew we were gonna have a little bit of time to talk about wind. Um, so thank you for that, Mike. And I did just kind of wanted, um, this is a really important issue. Um, and I really appreciate some of the things you said, um, Congressman Schrader, because you already can see where some of our concerns lie. Um, I, you know, as part of the Department of Interior, the BOEM process is certainly quite different than um, the transparent, uh, science-based, deliberative process that we're used to under the Department of Commerce with our regional fishery management councils. Um, so moving forward, I think that's really the important thing for, um, for this industry is that um, we have a deliberate and transparent science-based process that, can, that evaluates the impacts of the wind farms prior to the auctioning of the lease areas, um, prior to the train leaving the station. Um, you know, and something that I know is really important to you is meaningful engagement. Um, so that's what we're looking for with BOEM. Um, we're really hoping we can get in, uh, you know, it, like you said, in a proactive way on this. Um, but there are a lot of uh, concerns that we have. Um, we are very grateful that the support we are getting is from our state in the state of Oregon. Karen, who I raised her hand and I'm assuming she's gonna address this issue as well. Um, she sits um, on the BOEM task force. Um, the BOEM task force, however, doesn't have any opportunity for industry input or stakeholder input. It's all government agency folks. Um, so they also don't, they, they have eliminated requirements for uh, public involvement or public comment during their meetings. So, you know, this is the issue, meaningful engagement, transparent process, and the more support we can get from our state, the better. I will just flag for you that I am working with state, you know, state legislation as well. And I am concerned as we move forward that our state legislators feel that if it's out of state waters, it's not their concern or it's not a concern to their state, you know. So we're trying to uh, work with the state legislature to understand that, you know, things that are happening in federal waters are affecting, um, you know, their district and their stakeholders just as much. I think there's definitely a need for more coordination and anything you could do to sort of bring us all together in the state, we would really greatly appreciate. Okay. Good. All right, Walter, I think you're up. All right. Thank you, Cong Congressman Trader. It's uh, always a pleasure to have these meetings with you. And I I'm just going to kind of piggyback on what Mike and Lori said. I, I am able to participate in the BOEM meetings because of uh, being a port commissioner, but I do find it very hard uh, for the industry to have representation on the task force uh, because of the limitations of being an elected official. Um, 
and I and I'll agree with, with Lori also is there there needs to be a way for these impacts, environmental impacts, whether it be on whale, uh, seabirds, or or whatever, uh, be done before the uh, BOEM puts out these leases. I listened to a couple of these the seabird. Uh, roundtables uh, from down there in California. And uh, what was troubling for me is that the, the conservation community has, has not stepped forward on this. And uh, there was a representative from Audubon just basically said, uh, our way to fix this is just grow more birds. Well, um, I, I wish that the commercial fishing industry could say, uh, well, we, we, with our impacts, we'll just grow more whales. Uh, that there needs to be some fairness in the process. So, and I know that you're a big fairness person and uh, just, just highlight that. And what, one uh, nice thing is we, we are putting in the pack wave uh, site down here. That, that's a big, big plus for down here. Um, they're going to be coming ashore doing some drilling. State Parks is going to basically have a brand new parking lot with more ADA accessible areas down there. So there, there is a potential benefit for the, this offshore wave energy. And uh, the Port of Newport was very lucky this last year that uh, the governor did say that everyone needs to go outside and play. Uh, we have one of the biggest sport marinas in, in the state and uh, we, we did not see much of a downturn, so which we are very fortunate, um, but our infrastructure is failing and we need to uh, get both our sport and commercial infrastructure back up to speed. So th thank you for your time, Congressman. And we, like I said, we appreciate it every year you do this. You bet, thank you, Walter. Oh, sorry. Um, I think Karen is up next. Or Karen, my apologies. Yep, car in the garage. Thank you. <laughs> um, it's a tough one. Uh, yes, I did want to weigh in on offshore wind. This has been, you know, an ongoing um, concern for many years now. And one of the things that is really uh, disappointing is that the issue seems to kind of position fisheries as being anti-renewable energy. Um, and I just want to give a shout out to industry that um, that's, that's not uh, perceived to be the case. Um, there's a smart way to do this and to support renewable energy, and it's not to carpet the whole offshore area with platforms that may or may not be financially feasible in the long run. Uh, and so I just want to urge, um, you know, thinking, uh, problem solving across the board on the smart way to do this um, so that we can benefit from renewable energy uh, in ways where we can keep our um, existing industries viable as well. And just to that end, um, a shout out to the FMC process, we're trying to organize and engage uh, more effectively through that body. Uh, and so we have a, a dedicated discussion to this issue at the June council meeting coming up. Um, and then Lori already mentioned the BOEM Oregon task force, which is tentatively in September or October this year following a mapping process. Uh, and from there, BOEM intends to develop call areas. And it's really at that stage that decisions will be made, trade-offs will be considered and decided on how to integrate the information that they have collected. Uh, and um, there's concern about the transparency of that integration process and identification of call areas. And so we're just trying to increase our understanding of that and to find ways to engage in that. And uh, uh, Representative Schrader, I very much appreciate your suggestion of possibly you know, convening legislators, whether it's congressional or state on this issue. I think that could be a really effective um, conversation to just kind of figure out what, what those trade-offs are from the delegation uh, and to be able to speak to that uh, to that issue effectively and, and in a coordinated manner. So feel free to reach out to me um, to, to help with that effort on behalf of ODFW. Um, and you have lots of other partners on the phone here who uh, would help as well. So thank you. Very good, thank you. 
All right, Heather, I think is next. Thanks, uh, Jory. I just wanted to follow up, Congressman. I agree with all the comments that have been made by my colleagues here. Um, Walter brought up something that's been really disturbing is listening to some of the comments that folks have made both in the BOEM, um, recent BOEM webinar and also even with the ODFW site. Um, and I think for the ODFW, or not ODFW, OSU site, and I think it's not out of a, it's not a nefarious type of thing with OSU, but they were saying, well, we fishermen picked the spot years ago. And I said, okay, but a lot has changed in the last several years. How are you continuing the dialogue? And they said, oh, we're in contact with FINE, which is our local group of fishermen. And so I contact FINE and they said, we haven't heard from OSU in over a year. And so I think meaningful ongoing engagement is, is really um, important. And when Bohm was asked how they would avoid what's happening on the East Coast, the response was, well, this is a different coast and we're hopeful that it won't happen. Um, I jokingly say, well, a lot of us here are from the East Coast, myself included. Um, you know, and we have the same personalities as folks on the East Coast. So we no, are we <laughs> don't. We're so much better than those East Coast. We're gonna be <laughs> we moved out here and... for a reason. Jeez, woman. But you know, so there's just this tone deafness there, I think, and maybe a naive hope for uh, something to be different. I really, really like the idea of bringing everybody together, state legislators and federal to talk about this issue and how it fits in with the other ocean things that are ongoing, I think is really important. And I'll just end with, you know, after, over the last four years, over 1.5 billion pounds of whiting have been sustainably harvested just off the state of Oregon's waters. And that's worth over $140 million. I mean, uh, Principal Power wanted to set up in our prime fishing whiting zones. Um, there just has to be a better way. We can't trade fishing jobs that benefit our communities for offshore wind jobs. Uh, and I agree with Karin, we're not against green energy, but we need to be part of the conversation in an authentic way. So thanks. Got time for two more quick questions. I think Paula was up next. Yeah, hi, uh, good morning. Um, I w First of all, I want to thank you, uh, con Congressman, for all your support for the fishing industry, but also for coastal ports. And uh, you probably heard me talking enough about this, but I'm going to pick back on what Lori Steele and our Commissioner uh, Walter Chuck just mentioned about infrastructure. Uh, fishermen also need a place to land them more. And uh, as you know, that is a constant need here, especially in the coast where the weather kind of beat us up pretty good. Um, and recently, I, I understand um, uh, uh, the Maritime Administration created um, a pro projects for uh, small ports, uh, but that's still got uh, quite a large uh, in, uh, ask, initial ask of a million dollars. So. Um, we um, often have large projects, but sometimes we also have general maintenance projects that we we got to you know find funds for, and uh, I, I continue to ask for a more support for um, for infrastructure for small ports and especially on on the fishing side uh, for our docks. You know, again, the Maritime Administration often focus on cargo. And although we are working on that and hopefully we'll be bringing something here pretty soon to Newport, um, oh. we also got to make sure that our fishing docks are maintained and, and replaced as we are, we'll be looking for a large amount of funds here probably in the next year or so. So just want to, Keep reminding you that uh, you know the fishmen do need a place to 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 stay. So there you go. Thank you. Oh, good comments. Good comments. I'm hopeful as part of this infrastructure package that Peter and I have been working on with the uh, full utilization of the Harbor Maintenance Trust Fund stuff that that will provide uh, a very serious ongoing source of revenue uh, for our smaller ports around the country. So uh, good comments and stay tuned. All right, I think our last one is gonna be from Tim. 
Thank you very much. And I'm going to throw one bit of curveball at you at the very end, uh, although I will echo what everybody had to say about offshore wind and, and be in wholehearted agreement with everyone on the, those points. I wanted to get a quick bug in your ear about sea otters. Uh, there is a growing uh, effort uh, from the Alaka Alliance to uh, reintroduce sea otters. Uh, I will preface by saying um, we are in constant talks with the Alaka Alliance. Uh, they know our points on that. We understand that there may even be benefits to the reintroduction of sea otters to the Dungeness crab industry. Our concern is uh, that without proper guardrails uh, being put in place, uh, that we leave ourselves open for the potential for devastation to our industry. Uh, we are talking to them about the fact that we do not want to see it go forward without those proper guardrails put in place ahead of time, whether it is a uh, um, taking away the um, marine mammal protection for sea otters at a, at a much lower lim limit, or whether it is an agreement with the uh, tribes in Oregon to ha have them handle the culling, uh, but uh, have a number set in place for how much is too much. And uh, also to uh, have a actual goal uh, defined by them as to what their limit is uh, and not have it be too, um, for lack of a better term, loosey goosey. Uh, right now it's, well, we're gonna put this many in per year to try to, to try to get kelp forests back. And my point to them was, what if in five, 10 years, the kelp forests aren't back? Do you just uh, throw the paper out and say, well, let's put in 4,000. So, you know, put this in paper, put this in uh, the law somewhere that this is the exact number. It will never go over that amount um, and make that part of the goal so that you don't say, well, the goal is the thing and it takes whatever it takes uh, because uh, that, that's where we start to, the devil starts to get into the details. So uh, it's early days, but I did want to put it on yeah. your radar. That's great, Jim. That's uh, been hearing a little and seeing a little bit in the background, but it, you've drawn a, a bead on it and uh, that's helpful to us. That's one of the beauties of these types of conversations. Uh, theoretically, we can get a little ahead of the curve rather than just, you know, trying to come in late and clean up after something's already happened that we didn't really intend in the first place. So great, great work. Well, I want to thank everybody. Great call. Uh, great opportunity to learn a lot. Listen, uh, uh, you know, frankly, to each other. I think uh, every time I do a town hall or any type of it, I think it's always good that everyone hears what everyone else is concerned about and interested in. It informs the community at large. And sometimes you pick up some things you didn't know. I always pick up things. Uh, so it's very, very helpful. And we've got our work cut out for us, uh, you know, on the uh, electronic monitoring, make sure that rolls out like it's supposed to, uh, uh, making sure that any offshore wind development and embraces the entire community, the fleets, uh, in addition to the, to our local government friends and uh, uh, you know, that uh, there's things I can do in the appropriations process, hopefully working with my colleagues and uh, Farm Bill to make sure USDA truly recognizes uh, uh, the value that our fishing community brings to, uh, uh, to the food table here that we all enjoy. So I want to thank everybody. Special shout out to Barry for taking such a long portion of his day and come out here. Ryan, thank you too. And everybody else, uh, really appreciate it. Uh, next year, we're going to do this in person, guys. I swear, we're going to come in person and have a good time and, and break bread together. Thanks, everybody. Be safe out there.